She didn't like Bert. Bert told her that he talked to her on the phone once and told her that he liked her southern accent and that really offended her. She was really offended by that. But she she looked up his chart. She did his chart. And she said to me, if you marry this guy, you won't ever have to worry about money. And I went, show me the ring because I'm just in it for the money. <laughs> no, but she didn't tell me that. <laughs> what, did, what, what was the bad thing she said about me? Uh, she didn't say any bad things. She didn't have any bad things to say. Not that I remember. I, if she said anything bad, I probably immediately discounted it. Yeah. Because everything she always said was bad. Okay. Um, but I don't remember. That's the only thing I really remember. But um, I don't really remember. Has your podcast started? I don't know. Has it? I think so. Okay. All right. Can you find an edit place to get in on that? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I've no I've I've met her mom. <coughs> Sorry. I met we're taught yeah. I met your I met her mom one time. Only no, one no was it yeah, one time. Yeah, only one time. And she said at the end What well, should we say about how we met? So it's in a little bit of context. Yeah. Yeah. So I haven't my mom. And Sorry, I, this is morphing into. I apologize. I'm 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 driving for a second. Sorry, this is morphing into a, a casual conversation with Halston that is now. I think probably an interesting conversation. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. You know, I'll fix it with my intro. Okay. Don't worry about it. Let oh, me wow. drive. I've been driving for. This is my tenth episode. I think I'm a pretty good driver. You are great. I am. So, <clears throat> my mom and I have until a certain age cycled in and out of a relationship. So, like at thirteen. Uh, she stopped talking to me for a couple years and then again at 23 she stopped talking to me for a couple years and then inevitably because it's your mom and you think well I you know should have a relationship with your mom you try and reconcile and then it falls apart again and then so when I first started dating Bert uh, I was talking to her and then uh, it fell apart again at 33 stopped talking to me again so i had my first child at 33 and my mother had never seen my kids so bert and i went we could go back to see my family every year and his family um, but we were in alabama visiting my grandmother my mom's mom and <laughs> my mom just kind of showed up and I hadn't seen her in years at this point. We had two kids she had never met. How old were they, Bert? Like six and eight? No, Not I think that they were old. older than that. Not 10, 11, 12, 13. It's about five years ago. That might be right. Yeah, like maybe, maybe seven maybe. and yeah, nine, maybe. somewhere in that general vicinity. Mm -hmm. And she just kind of walked in and went, hey. I'm your nanny. And we were like, what? <laughs> had no idea she was showing up. That was the first time Bert had ever met her. She did not come to our wedding. She had never seen or talked to us ever. It was bizarre. Wasn't it bizarre? It was really crazy. And then, what are we doing for lunch? And she acted like she was there all the time, right? Yeah, like, it's so good to see you guys. I haven't seen you in forever. Let's go look at my house. And so we went down and looked at her house, and the girls were walking around with her, and they're like, how are we supposed to... Are we supposed to talk to her? And we're like, yeah, just... Just be considerate. Just be considerate, have fun. <clears throat> Went down and looked at her house. Um, and then she said, what are we doing for lunch? And they were like, let's go to the Mexican restaurant. Went to the Mexican restaurant and immediately I started drinking in front of her because I wanted her to... I, I just <laughs> I just was like, fuck you. Yeah. I got ordered a margarita with a, with a tequila floater. Yeah. And, uh, and then... We had lunch. It was great. I paid. And then at the end, we got out. She said, I can't wait to see you again. I said, that won't happen. She said, what? I said, that's that's not going to happen. We'll never see you again. She's like, what do you mean? I said, I've been married to Leanne for, you know, 10 years or eight years. And I just met you right now. I don't think we'll ever run into you ever again. Well, what she had said was, maybe I'll come to California to see you guys. And you said, that won't happen. Yeah. Because what the hell, <laughs> right? Who just shows up and goes, so yeah, I guess I'll come to your house maybe sometime soon. She's crazy. And so, yeah. And so it was, you know, kind of bums me out. Kind of bums me out because I wish that I had one more connection into your family, into your childhood, into your life. Like but that's I, all you need to know, 
really. Well, is that who shows up having not seen the birth of her two grandchildren? I'm her, I'm her only child. She doesn't even have stepchildren. There's nobody. So she's willing to throw every possibility of any relationship away with her only child and the only two grandchildren she'll ever have and then just show up like nothing happened. That's somebody who's not normal. What's crazy that about That was my it, whole childhood. What's crazy about it is meeting her after knowing your dad for as long as I have. Right? Her dad is maybe one of the most gen- generous, kind, like kind. People always say, use the word kind. Mm-hmm. That like, that's a, he is genuinely a kind man. Mm-hmm. He is I would say selfless. He's flawed just like all of us, but not like, totally. but not in like a, not in a fucking, not in a way that anyone would ever intervene in any situation ever to him and go, this needs to change in your life. There's no flaw in him where, where any, there definitely is no flaw in him that anyone in Bowden's ever going to see. Cause it, it would just be like the little, you know, whatever. He's just a good old boy. He's just a good old boy yeah. from rural Georgia. He's a sweet, he's ethical, he's... he's, he's yeah, he's, he's just a great kind, fucking he's giving, guy. He's a member of his community. He's just a regular, regular guy. And he got wrapped up with a really pretty girl who happened to be batshit crazy. And that is what I would love. If I had a time machine, I'd go back and see what they were like when they were dating or just had a kid. Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> that is night and... That's too globally different people i think it is i think my mother broke my dad um and i think he changed and then he changed again later when his second wife left so i think he yeah he was he's not the same now as he was when i was a kid for sure but but anyway yeah i don't think there's i think that's a pretty clear insight to what childhood was like i mean the first time she stopped talking to me i was 13 I hadn't seen or heard from her in years. That happens years. a lot to a lot of people as their parents oh. stop talking to them and burn all their pictures. That happens to a lot of people. She did burn all my pictures. <laughs> fucking lunatic. She burned all my baby pictures. She gave away all of my toys or anything I'd left at her house. She I will, I, I will say, out. In, in all fairness, my I dad... I was dead to her. My dad, uh, when I moved to New York my, and they cleaned out my stuff, mm-hmm. I had these boxes. My dad just threw them out. Yeah. Like, it, was all the stu- it was all my memories from college. I would love... I would pay twenty thousand dollars right now, yeah, to get those boxes, those boxes back. back and just go through them, yeah, and see some stuff I haven't seen in twenty years. My dad just threw them out. He was like, "What? They're here in the garage. They're taking up space." Yeah, my mom burned my baby photos. It's a little different. That's a little different. It might have a little bit of vindictive, a little bit of a pit viper. <laughs> my dad composted mine. <laughs> he did. Well, that's at least he was responsible. No, but when I was 13 and we stopped talking, I hadn't seen or heard from her in years. And I was a cheerleader in high school. It was homecoming. I was probably a sophomore in high school. And uh, my mom just showed up at the high school football game, dressed like she was just got off the runway with a video camera. And back in 1986, a video camera was a really big deal. So she showed up and all anybody could talk about was that Judy Judy is at Judy Kemp is at this uh, football game and she's she's so pretty you know she was a model she was beautiful so when she showed up the world stopped and everybody paid attention but I hadn't seen her since I was 13 I had no idea she was coming to this football game I'm just uh you know jumping around cheering having a great time and the, oh okay there's my mom okay haven't seen you in Two years. <laughs> That's bizarre. So you see the pattern kind of repeated at my grandmother's house where she just showed up after years of being completely vacant. I think that was that's her way of saying, I'm, I'm, I've forgiven you. Let's get let's move forward. And, and I don't even way. know if it's that. I think that she is in a denial that anything even went wrong. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's really bizarre. It's got to hurt knowing you you got family. I don't know. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't do that. I couldn't not. I was thinking about seeing my sisters tonight, but Isla's sick and I don't want to get Teddy sick. No, we can't go because Isla's sick and Annie's in Florida. Oh, really? Yeah, she's... Uh, now she's I feel working. like we're just having a conversation. We Annie's are. my other sister. Cotty's my youngest sister uh, and she had a baby named Teddy. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> by the way, she didn't have a baby and name it Teddy. She had a baby named Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> he does look like Teddy. She He's really cute. Ba- she had a baby named Teddy. He's fucking adorable. He's so cute. He's a really good baby, too. You know what I do? I love I, about life. I love loving things. Yeah. I don't want to get rid of that. I'm going through something right now where I feel like I need to establish boundaries and be more dominant and less of a punching bag in my family and in my, you know, and like, and like, cause I'm like, right. But I don't want to stop loving things. Like it's so funny when I first met Teddy, I loved him, but it's not my kid. Right. I had never felt that. I never felt no? love for something I didn't have. Make? <laughs> yeah. Or like. Contribute to making? Like I loved him and I wanted the best for him. Yeah. Like it's so bizarre. Because you don't do that like across the board. You don't do that across the board. You don't go like. Maybe some people do. Maybe I'm a shitty person. I don't know. When Cody was born, my cousin's son, I felt exactly what you're talking about. I I was so happy that little boy was born. And every little boy, girl after that, I, maybe it's just that no one in your family that you're close enough to had some had a baby. What was a mo- what did you love the most when you were a kid? What did I love the most when I was a kid? I, I I'm all I can think of is possessions. Okay, like what? Um I mean, I I loved, I loved uh, I, this this Duke Junior football. Uh huh. I love that fucking football. <laughs> I take that football. That's with adorable. Me I love this Duke Junior football. I love my loincloth. Yeah. I love my loincloth. The freedom I got when I got out of school and I put on my loincloth <laughs> was remarkable. Like I can't. It's the same feeling I get now. Like uh, when I come home from whatever uh-huh. and I put on sweatpants and I yeah. sit in my recliner, yeah, I, I, I get that same feeling on the road when I um, when I get done press and I get back to I get back in bed. Mm-hmm. I I'm usually naked and on the road, but I I get in bed and I do this thing where I go yes 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 <laughs> like <laughs> like I cheer for myself yeah you did it you got you, <laughs> like. Like, especially if you're hungover as shit, you go in and do radio, you don't drink, uh-huh. you just do radio, and you don't drink coffee either. You just stay away from all inebriants mm-hmm. so that you can go back and go to bed. I love that feeling. Now, do you want to know what my what I loved most when I was a kid? Yeah. Fatty, my cat. Oh, yeah. I had a cat named Fatty. He weighed 30 pounds. He was a badass cat. He would bring in like six feet long snakes. He killed a raccoon and brought it in our house. He killed possums. He was like having a little tiger. I freaking loved that cat. I don't know what I would have done without that cat. He was the best. He was the best. I didn't have any pets growing up, really. I mean, we had Arthur, but... No, but everybody in your house is allergic. No, but my dad got a dog and then just like... It was almost like, hey, we got this animal that'll be living outside our house and roaming the neighborhood. <laughs> he was an outdoor dog? Uh, yeah. Really? You didn't want uh, outdoor- the dog in the house? Well, no, the, no, my shock is this. Your parents' relationships to dogs since I've known them has been remarkably different than the dog will be outside. <laughs> and when I first met you, when I first went to your parents' house, <laughs> somebody said, don't go in the dining room. And I went, why? And they're like, just don't go in there. And at one point, I went in the dining room, and the amount of dog shit and pee on this one rug was alarming because they have this one dog named Thelma who is oh as God. old as dirt. Thelma was so old she had one tooth that a hair was perpetually wrapped around this one tooth. Oh my God, she had that I forgot one that tooth. a hair would wrap around that tooth. And one tooth and her breath because she chewed, like she had death. one tooth so when she <laughs> chewed on her arm on her arm, her hair would come out and it would just wrap around her tooth. It was disgusting. And you could slide the hair off you her could. tooth. Oh God, you I slid the hair off the tooth that like dog it was, was disgusting. old 
as fuck. It looked like my grandmother. She looked like she, she looked like grandma. She did look a little bit like grandma. They looked like a little they, emaciated with nice hair. Nice hair, but but one quaffed. tooth. Yeah, one tooth. <laughs> oh my god, we got Thelma because Arthur attacked Cotty. Uh, oh, I didn't know Thelma was after Arthur. Yeah, so but Thelma clearly lived in the house as did abigail and ina the two enormous uh, labradors ina was ina was they smelled horrible ina was uh, by the way i, I hope ina. i hope i hope i hope i'm wrong about this mm-hmm. okay and i hope that no one in my family is listening to this mom if you're listening please stop right now for a minute <laughs> just and dad is not listening but mom, if anyone in my family is listening please stop Okay. Okay. In my opinion, yeah, Ina was a by- byproduct of Annie's uh, youthful uh, drug adventures. <laughs> Why? I am not certain of this, but I'm. There were so many drugs in Annie's house when she lived with Abe. <laughs> oh, really? That it, there's no way Ina didn't eat marijuana or eat blotter acid or eat Something. mushrooms because that dog was so. It was like a meth addict. Like when you got to Ina, it was first of all it was terrified of thunder and lightning. So and and we lived in Florida. There's a thunderstorm every, every day, fucking every afternoon. day, every day. <laughs> but this dog would fucking lose it. She, she never learned. That she <laughs> she was just and she was skinny with like a long snout. It looked like the the dog from fucking the the Simpsons. Oh, oh, like uh, San, Santa's little helper. So it just, but it was a black lab. But it, it, so Abigail was my black lab. Abigail was part Rottweiler, so she had a big fucking head. Yeah. Not as big as Pris's, no. but same. No, but she was a big dog. She was a big dog. I met Abigail. I never met Ina. <sighs> I never met Ina. Abigail was Abigail was ornery. By the time I met her, she was basically like, "Fuck off!" Don't Abigail touch me. was real ornery. She had she attacked a lot of people. She did. Yeah, she was. But it was a college dog, so like... What could, does that mean? Yeah, I don't know. Dogs could attack people back then. No, they could not. Yeah, they could a little bit. That's because you, were, you weren't you were being alpha with her or something. I was being fucking hard. Look, if, if there was anyone alpha with that dog, it was me. Okay. It was not my dad. My dad, my dad. Your dad is my the dad worst sell- pet owner on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like a dog destroyed, send it to Al Kreischer because he will fuck that dog up. He fucks dogs up so <laughs> bad. Does, and then sends them to your sister. <laughs> he's, 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 he's like the Hugh Hefner of fucking <laughs> he dogs. Is. Like, is he get them and whatever you want, whatever you want. And no. they'd be like, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Oh, he was so bad at dogs. <laughs> And he doesn't play with them or anything. No, he doesn't like even when like a puppy. Them. The reason a puppy eats your shoes is because you don't play with them. If you play with them, they won't do that. He tells the same story about <laughs> Abigail over and over and over again. He tells the same story uh, one time, buddy. Like he tells it to me like I've never heard it. One time, buddy, I, I was at the office. I wasn't feeling good. I was sick. And, uh, and I came home in the middle of the day and I, I got in bed. I mean, I was really sick. And this goddamn dog Ugh. comes up and puts her face right on the bed next to me and tilts her head. She knew I was sick. <laughs> that's how close we were. And I was like, no, she that, she wanted something. She, she wanted yeah, you she to wanted be better. To, yeah, fucking, yeah, it's a dog. You're home. She normally is by herself watching Ina and fucking jump up on couches. And she's like, get me the fuck out of here. Mona's got one tooth. Um, or, not Mona. Thelma. <laughs> God, yeah. That was funny, huh? Oh, those! Uh, it's so interesting. Is because the best dog I've ever owned is Priscilla. Is Priscilla a hundred percent? Mona's a pretty great dog. Mona's a very sweet dog. I've been trying to work this bit out on stage, and it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. The premise is, I think it worked one time, and I didn't record it, and then I did it all weekend, and it just—I think it'll work better in Texas. Um. The premise is, okay, so sometimes with jokes, when you write a joke, what's fun to do is give you a setup that you immediately think, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. And then... Yeah, like the abortion doctor. Yeah, yeah, or, or yeah. So the setup was, I'm all for progress, but I think women should just take a page out of the book of dogs. And the whole premise being, um, 
do, the progress dogs have had within the last oh, 30 well, years. You're so just stupid. That's you're such a... <laughs> What's wrong? Like from being a yard dog into like running the house. Yeah. Like, you're yeah. so funny. That's really bad. <laughs> And like I go, they Rosa Parks their ways on the planes. They Rosa Parks their ways. Did you hear that this morning on NPR about uh, service animals on planes? No. That there's like. This might be part of my bit. Keep going. 780,000 uh, service animals flew last year, which is up from the previous year of 600 and some thousand, which is up from the previous year of 500 something thousand. Okay, this leads into my bit. Because all you have to do is pay $100 to claim your dog to be a, an emotional service dog. There's no requirements, but the dogs are freaking biting people. Oh, and- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dude, I, I told you this. I was in first class one time and a, a Doberman was sitting in first class, a uh-huh. Doberman, uh-huh. notoriously the dog that attacked all of us when we were kids. By the way, dog attacks, I'm sure, are down. When I was a kid, you got attacked by a dog. <laughs> Everyone got attacked by dogs. <laughs> there were stray dogs. Were, you rolled in dog shit. I mean, I rolled in dog shit probably four or five times in my life. Isla's rolled in dog shit. Isla rolled in dog <laughs> That is the funniest <laughs> fucking video. It is really I played it on. Did I play it on my podcast, my solo podcast? You last did? Week? It is the really funniest funny. fucking video. <laughs> and so... I mean, like, I remember Annie and I standing on one of those transformers, those green transformers, uh-huh. and a dog just, and we were in the sun <laughs> setting, and we're like, mom, <laughs> mom, and so, but no one's getting attacked by dogs anymore, like, it seems like, I know Whitney Cummings rescues dogs, she got attacked, but like, well, that's a little different, it's, it's a little different, but my premise was, dogs have Rosa parked <laughs> their way onto planes without a fucking sign, Without a sit-in. I don't think the dogs did it. The people did it. I know. I don't think the dog filled out the form. No, 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 no. (laughs) But you're missing my point. Women's progress is, is, is being... The women's suffrage movement, Mm -hmm. we'll go back to the beginning, had to be okayed by men. Mm -hmm. Meaning men had to say, yes, you can vote. Yeah. So in a weird way... I look at the say, look at the dogs as the women and the and the men as the humans. Yeah, M- humans have turned 180 degrees on dogs uh-huh. and been like, yeah, you guys can fly with us. Yeah, yeah, you can bring them into a, a Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Like they, dogs haven't done anything. Mm-hmm. They haven't done anything. Mm-hmm. They literally haven't like the people have evolved. It's I, I don't. Is it people that have evolved or is it? Well, like, yeah, because the dog is not going. Could you fill this form out for me so I can get on this plane? The premise the doesn't work choice. because it's slippery. Because I think people think I'm comparing women to dogs, and I, I don't. That's not well, what I'm doing. I I know I get it. You I have want to, I want the lead. You in, have but, to not be macro whatevered. Whatever. What do you call it? Triggered. No, macro aggressed. Yeah, micro aggressed. That shins. thing. Yeah. Same, same. So, uh, but that's service animals. I told you about the time that guy tried to bring the snake on the plane, right? A snake? Yeah, and the gate agent was like, I ain't letting no motherfucking snakes <laughs> on this motherfucking Shut plane. Up. <laughs> that's Shut the up. first time that's ever worked. I've, tr- I've tried that so many different ways. I've tried that so many different ways. I've never gotten that to work. Aww. Uh, shucks um but yeah i service animals that that doberman took a shit in first class <gasps> took a shit in first class and i it was did where it, 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 did it, it pee up, also oh yeah uh n- i don't remember really i don't remember only because it was someone just shit on <laughs> <in> first class. <laughs> it was it was a fucking it was a hundred pound dog just got up Got into the aisle, started circling, and the guy next to me was like, oh, this is fucking happening. And just shit. Oh, my God. And we were like, and the guy was like, I am so sorry. And all of us were like, I mean, by the way. Did he have a pee-pee pad? He just no, shit on he the just carpet. shit on the carpet. <clears throat> oh and it boy. smelled like someone took a shit Did in the first Did it smell class. like shit? It smelled like, I mean, technically... <laughs> Imagine me taking a shit in first class in the hallway. That's what it smelled like. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. This, it's equally as disgusting because it's a dog. Maybe it's because maybe he's got more of a refined diet than I have, so it's not as bad. But right. Um, but what's crazy to me, and you remember this, and people don't remember this, and you can't really share this on stage because people do this thing where they deny the honesty because it makes them look bad. Mm-hmm. But I remember a time when a dog shit in 
a place it wasn't supposed to that you put its nose in it. Yeah. And that's how you taught a dog not to shit in places. You hit it with a paper or yep. you beat it. You hit you it with a newspaper it, or yeah. you, you stuck we, his nose By the way, in. never did that to Arthur because Arthur no. never came inside. Well, we never did that to our dog either. What? We never never put Priscilla's nose. No, no, in no, 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 no. We put it in their pee too if they peed. That's uh, yeah. what we did back in the when day. When Priscilla, pe- this is the progress. When Priscilla, if Priscilla could talk to to Abigail, yeah, and be like, so, uh, birth what, pretty cool. What was huh? he like? What birth was pretty he cool. Like? Birth cool. And Abigail's like, ah, <laughs> unless if you peed in the house. And Priscilla's like, oh, because he gets really blamey because it's his fault. <laughs> and then Priscilla's like, I'm sorry, it's or Mona's. Priscilla's like, or Abigail's like, it's his fault. She's like, yeah, he wasn't paying attention to my schedule, and that's why I peed in the house. Right. And, and Abigail would be like, uh, no. One time I peed in my water bowl. I was so afraid of him. Oh, my God. <laughs> she peed in her water bowl. She peed in her water bowl? Yeah, and she came in, and she was new. If Well, by that's the way, because her owner was not letting her out in any kind of I timely manner. I was in fucking manner. college. Yeah, but, but that's pitiful. That's mean. I remember, um, I remember the first time. I'd never really... I, I did spank Abigail, mm-hmm. um, but it wasn't. I never hit her in the face. I'd smack her on the butt, but not really aggressive. And mm-hmm. I remember there was this one fraternity brother I had, and Abigail. And by the way, I was super lenient with her as a puppy. Yeah, like, like that. The time that I should have maybe spanked her. Yeah, uh, I didn't. I just yeah. didn't. I didn't because I didn't. I didn't. That's. I didn't see loving a dog that way. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then I remember Abigail peed. In a house at a party and there was this one redneck uh dude i won't say his name what doesn't matter and i was like abigail no and i went over and i put her nose in it yeah and i was like no no abigail and he's like you gotta beat that dog and i was like oh i don't hit my dog go, come here and then he grabbed her and he beat the fuck out of her he did and, and like not, why'd you let him do that he put her nose and he spanked her really hard <clears throat> and she whimpered and I was like, "Whoa!" I mean, I, it was. And I, no I was, wonder she attacked people. Some and I was, stranger. And I put him. Well, I, I know I'm sounding like a really horrible <laughs> dog owner right now. Maybe I shouldn't have told this story. But I remember going, "That's how you're supposed to raise a dog." And I never, I never like beat her. I like you know like, but I'd put her nose in it if she peed. Mm-hmm. And I and and if she chewed a shoe, I'd be like, "You put her nose in the shoe." And then if she chewed a shoe, I'd spank her. Mm-hmm. But like not beat her, but spank her ass. I don't think it hurt her, but I think it brought back memories of this one time. But man, I, we I've never, never spanked Priscilla. We've never spanked Priscilla or Mona. <clears throat> no, never. But the progress, I don't know where the progress came from. Well, it's, it's obviously a human evolution. Yeah. All right. <coughs> anyway, for all those people that now think that I'm a horrible pet owner, I agree. So I wrote down some questions to ask you today. Shh. Shoot. Are you ready? Yeah. I think you'll like them. Okay. You ready? Um, what do you miss most when you're away from home? Your vagina. <laughs> Excellent answer. <laughs> Is that really what you miss most? Yeah. If I could Not just, my if, pretty face. Oh. Not my laughter. It's my vagina. It's your vagina probably the most. No, I... What I miss <laughs> most... Well, I mean, I, I miss... I'll tell you what I miss the most. I don't... Oh, yeah, it's your vagina, I guess. I guess it really is your vagina. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I miss the girls. I miss the dogs. I don't miss Gus at all. I've never missed Gus once. Well, it's because you're allergic to him. If yeah. you weren't allergic to him, I think he would be your best buddy. And then I don't... You don't miss the chickens. I don't miss the chickens. I miss... <laughs> do you miss your children? What do you miss the most? Is vagina? <clears throat> is that your final answer? Yeah. Because from the outside looking in, I would think you miss our friends, like when we're all together, that that's what you miss the most. Because as soon as you land, that's what you want to do. You don't want to look at my vagina as soon as you land. As soon as you land, you're like, what are we doing? Who's coming over? I what, miss. What house can we go to? <clears throat> the thing I love the most about living in LA. Yeah. The thing that I go when I'm on the road, I go, I go, uh, I was, I, I I go back to this. I love after it's rained and the sun's setting. Mm-hmm. I love walking to Gelson's and getting food mm-hmm. for a party over here. Right. I love when people come over. I love 
getting food together. I love walking. I love when it's winter. I love when I have a month off, like in winter when I take that month off. Yeah, in December, and, yeah. Yeah, and I, or I did October this year. Mm-hmm. I'll probably do October again this next coming year. Yeah. But you, I love that feeling of, of, it's just so fucking great of walking around the city and do, and just being no pressure and right. just thinking of jokes and going into the Gelson's and getting food and then coming back and the girls and then you hear a knock on the ear, the ding, the do, the ring doorbell mm-hmm. and the dogs are barking and like Gruzins come in or the Hayslips come in or the Frompkins come in or my sisters come in or my dad shows up and you're just, I love that feeling. I love that feeling. Yeah. The impending party. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, if if you said if you could say you had some hero qualities, what would you say they are? Why are you rolling your eyes? I'm not because I'm you know I'm going through some fucking. Well, if you low had like a, a superhero or a heroic quality, what would it be? Uh, I can make strangers laugh. I can make strangers that I don't know, not just in on stage, but in public. I can make them smile. That's true. That's a great heroic quality. I can do that. I can make anyone laugh. And I'm, I, I used to te- I used to test myself. Yeah? Yeah. Like, I, I'm really good. Like, at checkout. Yeah. Like, when I'm checking out for, and like, buying anything or, or I go up to a counter of any sort mm-hmm. and I have a quick interaction with someone, I used to, I used to see if I could go, uh, go 100%, bat a thousand for the day and just everyone I run into, I made them giggle once. That's so funny because I do that a little bit. But not to make people laugh. I always want to make sure that everybody I run into has heard me say, hi, how are you? And not in a passing way, (laughs) but in a way of like, of like you're checking out my groceries. I don't want you to think that I'm dismissing you or think, you know, not I don't see you. I want to make sure that you know that I see you. Hi, how are you doing? You having a nice day? And I try to do that a lot. I don't really test myself, but I'm very aware of doing that, like in public with salespeople or strangers at a bus stop or in an elevator. Anyway, um, if you had to perform in a talent show, but you could not be a stand up, what would your talent be? What would you do? Um, <laughs> if I would, I honestly. <laughs> I don't know. That's an interesting question. I th- I feel like if I had to perform in a talent show and I couldn't do stand up, there's a part of me that is that is very earnest in wanting to be taken seriously. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. In a talent show, <laughs> it's because so, you're competitive. And so I probably would write a song you and would? perform a song. But here's the caveat. Okay. It would be so bad yeah. that it would end up being hilarious. But you can't do that. No, but that would be what would happen is it I when I wrote poetry, it was I would force people to read my to listen to my, my poems. When I was in college, I went through this period where I wrote poetry. I was really into Maya Angelou. But I was the my form of poetry that I was into was very rhymy. <laughs> <laughs> so that you wouldn't get stymied. Yeah. By the way, those would be in those boxes. My poem, right, right. my poetry oh, no. books. That my are composted, the out. composted poetry. Yeah, was all my poetry, and it was like I uh, remember. You know, one, he probably opened one and went, "What is this shit?" And I remember reading. Oh my god! If my dad read my poetry, oh my god! I just got I got uncomfortable. I got uncomfortable. If my dad read my poetry, he's like, he'll be he'll be happy I burned this. Oh, thank God! Thank God! No one else needs to see this ever i remember there was a poem i did we had a porch at our <laughs> old place and it was it was uh and we lived with these two tridelts it was me obi uh eddie and chris quinn one night we're having a party everyone's out on the front porch smoking cigarettes drinking beers and uh i came out with my poetry book and i was like you guys want to hear my latest poem <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I didn't have friends who like were like, I love poetry. <laughs> I had friends. Well, the people you just described, Obi might though now. The Obi I <laughs> now, know now. now. The Obi I know. Obi was a fucking meathead back then. Well, the Obi I know would have Eddie been like, That's still awesome. is a meathead yeah. and Chris Quinn. I don't know Chris Quinn. Oh, I, I think yeah, I've you met know him. Chris Quinn. Yes, yeah, you know I, Chris Quinn. I, I think I do. Chris yes, Quinn. I was the one of the by the way he's one of the funniest guys i've ever been around he's just him he grew up with like a bunch of brothers 
and a sister, but it's in a big house in like in South Tampa, like a big family. Yeah. And they broke balls all the time. Yeah. And he was like the second youngest. So Ooh. he got He got he, some trickle down bully he, economics. He, he got <laughs> they used to fuck with each other so much. Yeah. When you go to their house, they and then you'd get welcomed into the fucking with because they didn't have him and Ryan didn't have anyone to pick on. Mm-hmm. They they got picked on so much. So when you came over to their house to play, you then got picked on. Right. Like they invited you out to their house, so they, they had a little. Offset it. They yeah. offset it to you. And they say stuff like, "Mom, Bert's afraid to ask for a sprite." And I told him we don't have any, but he said he really wants you to go in the fridge and see if there's a sprite. <laughs> And his mom would go, I'm not going into the fridge. Tell your friend if he wants a fucking Sprite. And you go, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. So one night we're all sitting on the porch. I come out and I go, do you guys want to hear my latest poem? And they were like, "Uh, yeah. And And so I standing in front of them, they're all sitting on the porch. I stand in front of them and I go, all I remember about this poem was a man walked through the woods was the repetitive theme. A man walked through the woods, a knife by his side. Stuck in his glide, a man walked through the woods. A man walked through the woods, oh God. Uh, looking for love in a in a lot of. Uh, and he found a dove uh, uh, and a, one lost glove. A, a man, man walked through the woods. Yeah, okay. A man walked through the woods. <laughs> so like he lost both his teeth, <laughs> like that. His knife was in his sheath. A man walked through the woods. <laughs> a man walked through the woods. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this poem was two pages oh, long shit. in my poetry book. Oh my god! I when I flipped the page. Yeah. Chris Quinn goes. Let me guess. Let me guess. A man, man walked in the, the woods and the place fucking <laughs> howling, laughing, and I. <laughs> I was so hurt. You were so hurt. I was Aww. like, I was like, I'm trying to be serious. <laughs> oh. oh my god! So you think if you had to perform in a talent show, and you could be a comedy, do, you'd be a poet? I, I tried to do the 80 pie, uh, po- uh, talent show in college. Yeah. And uh, every rep, every fraternity got a you know yeah had people had people but you had to go audition yeah and they wanted to make sure it was and this is in my poetry phase oh and i went in and i read (laughs) by the way this is i hope you understand that what i'm telling you is not me ever trying to be funny this was in my earnest period right where i really thought i was going to be you took yourself very seriously i wrote a poem about date rape (laughs) What? I don't, but, but like, like from the woman's perspective of, <laughs> I don't fucking know. As if know. you could relate. Oh, by, the way, by the way, hold on. This song, this, this poem turned into a song. That you, that, that I you played sang? when I was in a band Called with Dacre and them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this, this one poem I thought was so good that I was like, I'm going to hang my head. This is my, this is my, my Nirvana smells like teen spirit. This one oh song. My God. And you'll never really know what the undertones are. Right. But because because I've masked them. <laughs> I've masked them. Oh, God. So I, I went in front of a panel of of uh, adult. I remember there were adults there, like the house mom and the girls. And I read my poem. Uh-huh. And they were like, that's very moving. Thank you so much. And I left. <clears throat> and I was like, I can't wait to perform. <laughs> my date to rape poem my to date rape everyone. Poem to everyone. I can't wait to show everyone what a artist I am. My, I'm the Jim Morrison of this generation. Of Florida, of Florida State. Well, he went to Florida State. Oh, he did? Yeah, and so I, I am now this new Jim Morrison. By the way, the next one was going to be Scott Stapp. That was the next Jim Morrison yeah. of our group. I get back to the fraternity house, and uh, I think it was, I want to say it was Charlie Erdman. I forget. I, I want to say it was Charlie because he was dating an 80 pie and I was like uh, he goes how'd it go I go fucking amazing it was great I, <laughs> and like a day later I was like I was like hey when do they when is are they gonna tell us like when do I go what do I need to do next and he's like yeah they're, they're not they don't want you to do it <laughs> and I went what oh no and he was like yeah they, it was a I guess it was a really bad poem oh my god like, oh like, my god what? What? And in my head, I was like, I remember thinking, how can anyone judge a poem? Like, you can't. It's, it's, it's objective. It's subjective. Yeah. Like, how the fuck can you judge a poem? And I was like, fuck them. They don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to turn this into a song. And I turned it into a song. Oh, God. If I had that poem uh-huh. right now, uh-huh. and I, if it was in that box, and I could sing it, I can still play it on the guitar. I don't remember the lyrics, yeah. but I can play it on the guitar. Yeah. If I could sing it, it would go viral 
Yeah. In a sense of, I can't fucking believe this guy thinks this is good. <laughs> it would be go viral and like, you know, when you're trying to be talented, yep. but you're so like the people that go on American Idol and you're like, they have no fucking talent. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. no one's told them. Yeah. That was my, if I was in a talent show, I would sing that song and it, people would laugh hysterically and I would get off stage and I would be crushed. Oh my God. I'm so glad I got rid of that part of my personality, the serious, earnest guy. That earnest guy. He's oh, still there a little bit. He got he got destroyed. He's still there. He shows up. He shows up with me from time to time. Does um, he? He does. He does. Um, have you ever stolen anything? I stole gum one time. You did? I stole gum. I felt, and I, I felt really bad. I stole gum, and a security guard saw me steal gum and chased me through Woolworths forever, and I got rid of the gum, and he caught me, and he took me to the manager with the opened package of gum that I'd stolen the one piece out of, and I was so flipped out because my mother was going to whoop my ass. I paid for the gum, and he let me go, but I about shit my pants. It was awful. I, uh... I stole gum at. I, I wanted. I wanted to remember the name of this. I went into a spiral of uh, re, of grocery stores in the South mm-hmm. the other day, where I just was like researching all the grocery stores in the South. Why? I just was curious. I saw a sign for a place. I must have been traveling, and I saw a sign for cash and carry. Uh huh. And I went, oh, and then I researched cash and carry, and I was like. A cash and carry was basically, I think it came right after the war in America, but there was cash and carries in, in Florida. Yeah. And what it was, this guy had this um, restaurant or had this, had this like uh, produce and like, it was an Italian immigrant who had a produce and meat and grocery stand. Yeah. And he wanted it to get bigger and he changed the name because it was a popular phrase. Oh, you should go to the cash and carry, you, should, you know? So he changed his to cash and carry with K's. And so he franchised them in in the, in F- Florida, and yeah. now they're going out of business. And now they're called oh. they're they, they're called something else. I think they went back to his original name of what he called it the first time, hmm. um, Butterfields or something. But um, <clears throat> so I start. But I wanted to remember the name of this place, the place that I stole that because I. It was at a place like a grocery store. So I stole something out of. I stole a piece of gum. Yeah. And later that day. And by the way, this goes back to my the way my how crazy my brain is. Later that day, a girl pretended to get kidnapped out of that same place. What? She parked her car and then claimed to be dragged through the woods and kidnapped and raped. I think she was a teenager. I want to say the place is called Family Mart. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, <clears throat> in somehow, when I heard about that, my mom's like, oh my God, can you believe that happened at Family Mart? We were just at Family Mart. I somehow believed that I was going to be connected to it because I stole gum. <laughs> of course you did. I, and I started to spiral. And I went up to my mom. And I was like, there's something I should tell you about this. <laughs> I, I must have been. I, I must have been. I, I don't know. I wasn't that old. Somehow <clears throat> the gum <clears throat> is connected to this woman's kidnap and rape. And my wife and my mom, my mom was like, uh, you stole gum? And I go, Yeah. So I, just in case they come back after us, like if they come, if I don't know if they go through They're going to question you or. Yeah. Like I was like, they'll go through security tape and they'll see that I stole gum and then they'll be like, oh, we must have something to do with it. My mom's like, my, my mom was so tapped out at that. And just, she was like, I, I think you're fine. And I never, I've never stole anything ever again. I went to, um, recently I was somewhere. My memory's getting so bad. I was somewhere and I was buying something and I was also, I was buying, uh, I was buying Rogaine uh-huh. and uh, and those Hawaiian punch packets I like. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the guy swiped the packets. Yeah. Swiped the packets and then put down the packets, thought he grabbed the Rogaine and swiped the packets again. Yeah. And he goes, your total's $4. And uh, Rogaine's $50, yeah. $35. And I said... Hey, uh, I think you didn't swipe the Rogaine. He goes, no, I got it. I said, I'm certain you didn't swipe the Rogaine. He goes, no, I did. I said, no, Rogaine's $35, and you said it's $4. And he went, what? And he looked at it, and he went, oh, my God. Oh, wow. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you doing that. And I was like, no, I didn't. I don't. I have, yeah. the, you know, like. <clears throat> I do that, too. I don't, I don't try to <laughs> cheat. 
I always thought if you get home from the store and there's been an error, that's one thing. But if you're standing there watching it and you see the error happen, then ethically you should handle it. You know what I mean? I don't know if I would get home with the Rogaine and then go, oh, shoot, he didn't he didn't charge me. I don't know that I would go back to the store and then have him charge no, me. No, no, I wouldn't do that. But if I saw it happening in front of me, I would do the same thing. I'd make sure you got, because that's dishonest. And then that comes back to you karmically in the universe. If you uh, yeah, I don't, I don't steal. I don't steal. I don't steal. <clears throat> and I think that goes into my stand-up. <clears throat> I'm very litigious with myself <clears throat> about even... Uh, if I hear someone that has a premise similar to mine, mm-hmm. I go, I got to get rid of the premise. Right. Um, now I will, I will put a caveat in that is say I'm getting ready to shoot a special. This hasn't happened ever, but I, I if say I'm getting ready to shoot a special yeah. and I'm, I've got the di- hour dialed in and someone goes, Oh, by the way, I have a joke similar to that. At that point, I'm like, it's too fucking late. Right. Like I've, I, I, that joke connects tissue. But if I'm watching stand up and I see someone do a premise similar to mine, and it hasn't happened, I think, because I'm, my stand up's so personal, but I will not, I'll lose the premise altogether. Right. Like I'm right now, I'm doing this chunk on dogs. I want to do a chunk on dogs about Priscilla's knee surgeries, about the time she swallowed the fucking rawhide. Raw mm-hmm. And then, and how she continuously tries to kill herself. Remember, yeah. I told you that in the pool one time you yeah. laughed yeah and uh and then i want to do a bit on gus i i i get nervous because i go man a lot of people have dogs yeah like a lot of people could write a joke about their dog oh i see and so nah, but no i don't think you need to worry about it which i like these questions leanne you do okay if you had to compete in an eating contest what food would you eat Ooh, buffalo shrimp uh, from hooters really oh it's my favorite food ever I love them. Buffalo shrimp by from Hooters. <laughs> That'd be a big pile of buffalo shrimp. I could eat 20 very easily. <laughs> I think an eating contest would require that you eat a little more than I could 20. probably eat 100. <laughs> I could probably eat 100 buffalo shrimp. Uh, I love chicken wings. I could do chicken wings. I could do buffalo shrimp. Chicken wings. I love chicken wings. I know I you love do. Chicken wings. You can tear up some chicken wings. God, man. I love chicken wings. I've never seen I, anybody strip a wing like you. I love chicken wings and I like buffalo shrimp. Um, or vodka sodas. Or vodka sodas. <laughs> I sometimes think to myself, I bet I really could fucking be like a competitive drinker. (laughs) (laughs) What would you rather be, a police officer or a firefighter? Oh, a cop. You think so? Yeah, but I'm... (laughs) There's not enough authority in firefighter for you? (laughs) Uh, That's exactly what I'm thinking. That's that's exactly what I'm thinking. (laughs) Do you realize what a fucking problematic cop I'd be? You would be terrible. I'd be a horrible cop. You would be be terrible. uh, I would be... I'd be the good cop that you'd be like, like that would be in the viral video of being in, in the, in the hood and doing the funny dance and rapping with the kids and playing basketball. And someone got a video on their cell phone and they're like, that cop's a great cop, but that'd also be the cop that shot way too many people. Cause I just get nervous. I got to pick up my guns by the way today. Then you would be fired. I would, but you like, I would definitely pull people. my gun out way too often. I would definitely, I would pull people over all the time. I would be. I am the reason you shouldn't be a cop. Oh, that's pretty funny. If you do a, pro- a, pro- a personality profile of me and then match that up to other guys and go, oh, you're a lot like Bert. Go, oh, don't let him be a cop. That's pretty funny. You remember, I don't know if you remember this. You remember a few years back, a long time ago, I took a like a job assessment test that told you what would be the best jobs for you. Yeah. You remember that? I do. <clears throat> uh, my top three. Uh, okay. Hold on a second. What? I do remember this. Yeah. I want to say something in the military. It was police officer. Police officer. Farm manager or writer. Those really? are my top three. I feel like I do all three of those already. I'm a farm. You would be a great cop. I would be a great Is cop. Is it too late for you to be a cop? It might not be. Maybe I should pursue that. Baby, you should get a job as a cop. I'd be a really good detective. How, how long does it take to become a detective? I don't know. It's got to be like. I think if you have a college degree, it goes faster. You don't have to be a beat cop. Could you be, would you be interested in being a cop? No, nah, I don't think so. Cause I have two young kids. I think it's a little scary. I'd be a really good cop though, right? You'd be a great cop. I think I would enjoy I'd it. I'd probably be a better fireman, but I, 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 I you probably would be a better fireman. I would. But the, there's more show in the cop, right? Yeah. <laughs> the fireman's just a selfless, thankless, I mean, 
Although you would have to be a paramedic if you were a fireman, so maybe not. Uh-uh. Maybe not. You have cancer, for sure. I'm sorry. I know you were in a car accident, but let me tell you something. You probably have cancer. Uh, I can't really deal with what you're going through right now because it's tweaking a lot of my OCDs. <laughs> what? So... <laughs> right? Okay, what job did you want when you were a kid? Like when you were a loincloth. What did you a professional want football player to when be? I was a loincloth. You <laughs> Yeah, by the way, I have... I, I talked about this... <laughs> Did you play football? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You played football? Oh, I was... My favorite fucking thing was the Duke football. My dad... My dad Yeah, but you not, played football like on a football team? Let, like Pony League? Let me tell you my story. Okay. So, my dad <laughs> does not hand out compliments super easily. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I... <clears throat> I remember telling my dad I was the fastest kid in school. I'd run the 40-yard dash, oh. and I was the fastest kid in school. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you'll never be faster than me. And I said, uh, I don't know. I'm pretty quick. I know I've told you this. Yes. And so we went in the front yard on the sidewalk, and he said, let's go. And he said, one, two, three, go. And I was hauling ass, and I looked up, and my dad is in front of me by, by like 10 feet running backwards. And he goes, you'll never beat me at anything. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't but at all damaging. He told me when we played football, whenever we had a catch, we had a lot of catches. My dad was always good about, now I don't think he ever once said we couldn't have a catch. Right. And so he said to me every time, he's like, God damn, you have a great arm. Like you have a great spiral. He was like, you really could play. You could be a quarterback. And I was like, nice. So he wouldn't let me play. Uh, and I'm really grateful that he wouldn't let me play yeah. as a kid. <laughs> Really grateful because I definitely would have. I definitely would have CTE. Yeah, um, for sure. He didn't let me play until seventh grade. In seventh grade, you could join junior varsity, mm-hmm. and I went to my mom and I said, "I think I'm going to play football." And by the way, I had never been happier about a decision in my life ever. Mm-hmm. And my mom was like, "Well, it's, you're playing with ninth graders, and they're a lot bigger. I don't think." We're comfortable with that. And I went to my dad. My dad said, buddy, this is your life. If you want to make this decision, this is up to you. And I said, no, I'm definitely, I want to play football. Very first game I played in, my parents were there. Uh, I caught an interception and ran it back to the one yard line. It was like, wow. And I was put on a pedestal. It was like the biggest play of the game. And everyone was like, I was in seventh grade. And everyone's like, you are a fucking natural. Right. And I was like, yeah, I had an amazing season, my seventh grade season, an amazing season. I was a starting middle linebacker and, and, uh, and it was, and I, I, I think I caught two more interceptions. I was just really, I was really good. I was, I was really good. And by the way, I was pretty big for seventh grade. Right. So I was bigger than a lot of the eighth graders. Right. And, uh. And the ninth graders too, like the ninth graders, it wasn't like, I also went to a private high school or private grade school at the time Mm -hmm. where it was predominantly Jewish. So we didn't play a lot of beasts. We didn't play any public school kids. We were playing kids just like ourselves. I was like a star athlete in seventh grade. Right. Eighth grade, uh, I go to play, uh, very first game, catch an interception, run it back for a touchdown. And, um, I'm off to the races again. I'm also playing offense, uh, and I'm moving around the offense, and I'm like, this is going to be my path. That next week, in practice, we were doing some drill where you rolled backwards or whatever, and I fucked my neck up. Oh. And it's the, my neck problem that I have to this day. <clears throat> I fucked my neck up, and I couldn't move my neck, like, at all. And I was out for half of the fucking season. Oh, man. And, and when I did come back, I was... I played, we played against uh, some Trinity prep, I think. And they, I was an outside linebacker and I, these kids were so much bigger than me. I was like, I have no fucking chance. Like I was so outmatched. And so I went in ninth grade, I moved over to Jesuit Mm -hmm. and everyone was like, you pretty much got to focus on one sport. Ah. And I was like, I was a much better baseball player. Right. By the way, in my seventh grade, no joke, seventh grade, I played baseball at at Berkeley. And I hit, I think we had nine games, and I hit 21 home runs. Jeez. 
Okay, there's a there's a caveat to this too. <laughs> was the field short? The field was short. We were playing on a girl <laughs> softball field. Oh, you play on softball. <laughs> on a girl softball field. It was softball a short field. field. And so I was jacking everything I hit was <laughs> off home run. <laughs> I mean, I was like such a star athlete, and then I was like <laughs> in your own mind. Oh, I in was. Your- <clears throat> They wanted me to play varsity baseball when I was in eighth grade. And I was like, no, I'm going to try to hit 40 home runs this year. <laughs> and then they moved us to a bigger field and I just was okay. <laughs> but then I went to Jesuit and I was, and I <clears throat> tried out for baseball in ninth grade. I tried out for baseball, basketball. I think I probably, I don't think I tried out for football, baseball, basketball. I, and I didn't, I got, didn't get put on any team. It was the first time I'd you ever get put on baseball. I team? didn't get put on, I didn't get. I didn't get put on a baseball team. This is before we had a JV team at Jesuit. It was just a varsity team. Kamen made the varsity team. Scott Bo Beer made the varsity team. And Brad Radke made the varsity team. Brad Radke, out the way, oh, by the way, went on to play professional baseball. Um, and I think Kamen could have, too, if he had stuck with it. But, um, and I didn't make any team. I didn't make, I didn't make the JV basketball team. I didn't make anything. So instead, I ran track and I swam, which were fun, uh, but they weren't like... I didn't have a passion about swimming, nor about, did I about track. And then sophomore year, I tried out for baseball, and I made the JV team and the varsity team. Like mm-hmm. there was a like I could dress for varsity games sometimes, and I played all the JV games. And that's when I started to excel in baseball. I see. So I think I started developing. I started working out. And junior year is when baseball just took off for me. Right. And I started my junior year. I started. I took a position away from a uh, from a senior. And it was a fucking nightmare. Like, I bet. Oh, it was it was tough. And then and I started lifting weights. I got yoked. <laughs> I was oh, that's when I started calling myself Nature Boy. <laughs> Rick Flair. I used to call myself Nature Boy. <laughs> Why did you think Rick Flair was, was like in the such shit? Great shape. Did you watch wrestling? No, but I just I but I did. Some, you know that Nature Boy was Rick yeah, Flair? Of course. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I grew up in Florida. Well, I know, but I yeah. just you know your dad's not the wrestling. Yeah, but football. Play, and guy. then and then I think you know at some point I was like I think I'll probably just play professional baseball. And then, um, and I remember my dad telling me in the car one time he was like. Uh, he was very candid and he's like, buddy, you'll probably never play professional baseball. And I remember thinking like, how can you say that to me? I have a dream. And he was like, no, like the guys who play professional baseball who will play are the guys like Brad Radke, who everyone notices that his talent is beyond everyone else's. Right. And he's like, and I was like, really? He's like, you need to look for in life the thing that Brad Radke has where everyone goes, oh, that's what he's going to do. Right. And the first time I did stand up, I called my dad up and I said, I think I found my Brad Radke thing. That's an amazing roadmap he gave you. And he, I said, really? He said, really? I said, dad, I didn't write any jokes and I could speak for, th- I spoke for 30 minutes and I killed. And I, and I said, I, and I, it wasn't. I felt so comfortable on stage. Right. And he was like, well, then that's what you got to do. Now, what do you think he thought you would do? I thought I'd be a lawyer. He did? Yeah. Do you think that's because he's a lawyer? Yeah. Or you don't think it's because he saw any qualities in you that were lawyer-esque? Uh-uh. No, he thought... <clears throat> it's just the path he knew. One of our good friends, uh, one of our really close friends, obviously, the guy came and I talked about, his mm-hmm. dad is one of the biggest lawyers, was one of the biggest lawyers in the state of Florida, kind of revolutionized... Um, he was I a think. trial attorney, wasn't he? Was he? A tri- it was, I th- I th- he was a trial attorney. But my dad said to me, you have what Benny has. He goes, I don't oh, have that. Oh. He's like a likability. He's like, Benny goes into, his name is Benny Lazare if you want to look him up. He's an amazing, I think, personal injury lawyer, um, trial lawyer. He goes, Benny goes into a courtroom and jurors fall in love with him. Ah. Uh, and he was like, you've got what Benny has. And he goes, I think you'd make a great personal injury lawyer or a trial lawyer because you could go in and people just like you. And, <clears throat> and, I, and I thought when we were looking for my first sitcom, I actually pitched. I said, my dad told me I'd make a great trial lawyer. I said, what if I was a trial lawyer, played a trial lawyer, and the reason I was a trial lawyer was because I wanted to be a stand-up. And so I, my trial lawyer, my, my trials were hilarious. Like you right. followed a trial yeah. that I was, I was the Matlock, but the reason you watched it was watching me with these people work out bits and do crowd work. And, right, right. And they were like, eh, I don't know if it's, that's right, but. Might be a little complicated. Yeah. Um, what do you think is your best characteristic as a parent? 
It's not. Uh, it's, uh, I can tell you all the ones. Not, it's no, not. no, I don't want to know what it's not. What is it? What's your best one? Um, a playfulness. Yes, that um, is very true. I'm just playful. You're like, very playful. I like. I like playing with the girls. I like teasing them. I like. I love when they get in, they get in my bed and we all fuck around. You like having a catch. I love having a catch. I love getting a fucking big slide. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I love getting in the pool with them. I love road I love, trips. You love everything. I love Christmas Eve uh, when I went into the closet, put on a speedo, and jumped in the pool, and all the kids jumped in the pool. I love playing with my kids. Yes, you do. You're really good at it. Yeah. If there's um, one thing that you could change about yourself, what would it be? Self esteem. Your self esteem. You'd make it worse. I make it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope anyone's enjoying this. I've never seen you laugh as much. Um, no, I'd make it better. I would I would give... <clears throat> I said this to someone the other day. I, w- I wish I had a better sense of self wor- self-worth. Mm-hmm. I wish I felt better about myself. There's a comedian that I won't name that I was talking to Tom about last night. And I had said, I wish I had an ounce of of this comedian's un- unawareness of like just how bad they are as a comic at her uh, it was, it's it's a girl so <laughs> i just said her but yeah. uh <clears throat> i wish i i wish i could just have an ounce of her confidence right because confidence relative to talent yeah. Oh, because you're confident. I'm confident, but, but you're, but you're saying her confidence. I go. I come off stage. Talent. I don't even know time. who you're talking about. So. I come off stage every time, and I go. I, I could have done better. I I see the flaws. I see the holes in my game. Mm-hmm. And I saw this person come off stage one time, and they did not do well. And they explained in the most confident way why they didn't, and how that has nothing to do with their talent. And how it has more to do with the way that the show is booked. And I was just like, I wish I could do that. Mm -hmm. I wish I believed that. And then I said to someone, oh, I wish I had their confidence. And this other person was like, oh, you have no idea how confident that person is. Really? Unaware, unaware of surroundings they are. So are they narcissistic? Oh, hardcore, hardcore, oh. like beyond, beyond. Well, that's ridiculous. And so, like, but but, but I just you don't want to like, be that. But I, I mean, wish I had a little, a little bit. bit of that. I wish I had a little bit. You, with, you already have a little bit of that. A little bit. I wish I had a little <laughs> bit of it where I was just like I was just blown away at like. I wish. You had a little more self esteem. Or, or uh, I was less. I wish I was less self aware. Like I, I, I wish I was more confident. Uh, you know, believed in myself, and I believe in myself, but like I can beat myself up sometimes. Yes, you can be very self-destructive. I was I was being self-destructive yesterday. I was beating myself up yesterday about my career and what am I doing and this and that. I can't believe I fucking like I'm posting videos on Instagram and why can't I shoot any good videos for Instagram? Why is everything seems derivative of this one thing I did that was successful one time and I need to be more original. I, I need to th- have better thoughts. And then last time I did the podcast with those three guys mm-hmm. and uh I said something and he goes, oh, my mom is like a huge fan of yours. And I was like, what? He's like, my mom and brother, I talked to them today and they were like, oh, you're talking to the guy from Instagram. And I was like, they follow me on Instagram? He's like, oh, yeah. And they're like, your Instagram's awesome. That's what I hear from a lot of people too, is that your Instagram's amazing. And I was like, oh. And I was like, I wish I had, maybe you'd told me that first thing in the morning so I didn't sit all day (laughs) beating myself up about how unoriginal I am. But this other person, the other person I'm talking about, Uh um, would never ever question their Instagram. Would right. Never question it. Right. Just think they're awesome. I'm killing it. I want. I want to be that. I, w- I wish I could have an ounce of that person that just walked around like I'm killing it in life. Everybody, I'm fucking destroying. But you I'm, wish you had more of that. I wish I had a lot more of that. Because you do have some of that. Yeah. Um, what is the one thing you would never change about yourself? My um. My silliness your silliness i love i love that i love so when the first time i ever wrote a joke i was in an english class and we were supposed to be writing uh whatchamacallit 
and I decided I wanted to write I wanted to write a joke. I think I think I had come back from Russia and I had met the guy had met the state in Russia or in Europe, back, back bringing through Europe. And I decided I wanted to be a comedian. Mm-hmm. And the one thing David Wayne had told me was always, always be writing and always get on stage. Just start writing and just, and so I sat in there and I said, I'm gonna write my first joke. And I wrote a joke about, um, the battle of Bunker Hill. Mm-hmm. I, I always thought it was silly that he was like, <clears throat> see the whites of his eyes and no one questioned it. Wait till we see the whites of their eyes. Right. I was like, what if you did a, what if you did a sketch where people questioned it? People are like, I think that's really close. And he's like, wait, I don't, this isn't up for debate, guys. Mm-hmm. And the guy's like, well, what if we, what if, what if we wait until we see their belt buckles? That's a little more noticeable. <laughs> and then someone's like, what if their shirts are on top? He's like, good point, good point, good point. All right, socks. Whites are their socks. You can still keep the whites. And I wrote it. It never was like, it never got to a place where it ever would work. Right. But I was walking to my car and I was giggling to myself about it. Right. And I stopped and I thought, are you allowed to giggle at your own thoughts? Like I, 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 I really stopped and I went, "Am I crazy?" Are you allowed to? Yeah, I, I'd never giggled. I'd never had a thought that made me giggle. Yeah, like by myself. And I was like, "I keep knocking this mic." Sorry. And I go, I got in the car and I couldn't stop giggling about it, about all the different scenarios. Um, what if they're wearing sunglasses? Like, and then I just start giggling. They don't have any men in sunglasses. How do you know what sunglasses are? And I thought, oh, am I losing my mind right now? And I. <laughs> talked to John Daker and John Daker was like, Oh, I giggle all the time. I said, for real? He goes, yeah. And I, and I was like, Oh, he does giggle. And I, that at that day, I changed the way I looked at the world. And I literally was like, I'm going to giggle. And then, and then I'm going to giggle. I'm going to just giggle. I love <laughs> giggling. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. Laughing is so much fucking fun. And I've incorporated it into my life in a way that all I do is look for things to giggle at. That's, That's my great. whole life is spent looking for things to make me giggle. When I was jogging behind that girl in Hawaii, Mm -hmm. I know I told you this, Mm -hmm. and I looked at her butt and I went, yeah, but I bet that butt couldn't sit through homework. I started giggling (laughs) so hard. I started giggling so hard. That butt probably couldn't sit through homework. You're right. And I was like, I was like, and I, I was laughing. I was jogging and I started laughing. Right. And I thought, do how many people laugh hysterically while they jog? I was like, I'm so lucky that I get to giggle that that's and, your perspective on the world is that your perspective on the world is defined uh, humor but it's not always your perspective on it's the not world always my perspective. sometimes your perspective is very different Dark. so like at grandma's f- funeral i giggled because i remember thinking yeah. i remember thinking why do they have her so sad they should have her smiling and then I thought, that who the fuck wants that? I'm like, that's <laughs> creepy. Her, like, like, hey. That's creepy. <laughs> Maybe you can have her with a wink. Yeah. A wink, one eye <laughs> open. <laughs> that would be creepy. Yeah. So. So um, there was something I wanted to talk about uh, that I actually been meaning to bring up to you for a while. Uh-oh. And I keep forgetting. No, no, no. Um, do you remember when we used to have summits? Yeah. We haven't done that in a long time. So I think we should have a summit again soon. About? I don't know. We used to have summits where we would just kind of go, what, what are we, where are we in our marriage and our career and life with kids? And where do we want to be? Remember how we used to do that? Yeah. And it was really helpful, wasn't it? It was really helpful. But why, why did we stop doing that? I think because everything started going positively. I think we were having summits when we were like. Broke. When, and when we were broke and like, I remember we, didn't we have a summit about buying a house? Yeah, we did. And you were like, you were like, we're buying a house. And then once we got the house. We haven't we, done another summit, have we? We haven't really, like, I think, I, yeah, we should have a summit. But I, I, I think we're at a place where the summit might be like, now it's like our, I think our goals are going in different directions. You think so? A little bit. Why? I don't know. Like, I, sometimes when I say like. I say stuff like, I want to, I want to live at the beach. And you're like, I'm not living at the beach. I want to live in the mountains. And then I go, okay, all right, let's put that on the back burner. And then I'll go like, I want a new house. You're like, I love this house. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to get a new car. I like that new Escalade. We don't need a new Escalade. Like our summits are. Well, that's not entirely true. I did say get a new car. Yeah, but like, I think our summits now are just like a little smaller. Probably. They probably would be a little smaller. I think back then we had so many, there was so much, so much. To figure out. There there was so much confusion in where we were going. Yeah. I remember I said this the other day, you, 
at your lowest, when we were talking about luck, mm-hmm. me and Shane were talking about luck on my podcast. And <clears throat> I said, you know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I've always been very, very lucky. I've just, I am very, very lucky. Uh-huh. And you said at one point, I feel like I jinxed you. And I remember at your lowest, you were like, we're just going to send the girls to prom from this fucking apartment. apartment. <laughs> you used to say that all the time. I and did. I, but I did not. I didn't see the world the way you saw it. Right. I didn't see that getting a house would set you up for the rest of your life. That getting into a house would give you security and your house would, and that we, I didn't realize that all I saw was the economy's at the lowest. There's no way we should get a house. Everyone be safe. Bundle up. And you're like, now's when we get a house. Those summits changed our lives. If we didn't bought this house then, I really honestly don't know what we'd be doing. I think that summit change our life so maybe i should explain what the summit is a little better yeah right so we call this the summit it really was like a family meeting and our kids were so young they weren't involved in the meeting but we bert was a comic i was working in an apartment building managing 139 apartments in three buildings i was not happy i was miserable working that job how much were you making uh i was making well we had free rent free rent we had health insurance which those two things were pretty major. And then I drew a small monthly salary of like maybe $1,000. Which went to our nanny. Which went mostly to the nanny so that I could work the job. So basically I paid for rent and health insurance. But I was a writer before uh, before I got so hardcore into this job and I was not happy. And arguably that is probably the most... No, inarguably, that is the hardest job I've ever worked. And I've worked in so many different... I've waitressed The apartment building. Yes. It was so stressful because I had no permanent maintenance man. I had no housekeeping staff. I had to vend out everything. So if anything happened in that building, I handled it. I had to call someone to fix it. And for 139 units in the middle of Hollywood where everybody's... And it was a high-end apartment building... It was a lot of work to do that and have two kids at home and have you traveling like five days a week. It was hard. And I miss I, it a little bit. I don't miss it. Not fucking one ounce. I not miss, at all. I miss bringing the girls over to the office at like four o'clock when you're getting ready to wrap out. Yeah. And you being in there and them running in and you getting up from behind your desk and giving them hugs. Yeah. And then them eating candy and then me and them walking back to the house because your apartment your office changed and it was no longer in our building right when we first started our office was in my office was in our apartment Mm -hmm. and then uh the apartment buildings were purchased and they got they fired the other two managers and gave me three buildings so they moved me to an office on site at a different building like a block and a half away from our where we were living the guy that purchased those i always liked that oh i love him he he hit me up the other day about going to uh a concert no he wasn't the problem none of it was it was none the of job the people it was that, was it was that you were going after your dream that and i kept saying this is this is an unrealistic expectation of what one person can handle yeah i, I can't handle this much workload it's just more workload than i could handle so um i needed to get out of it so i needed to get to to go to something anything else just to get out of it for a long time. So we would have these summit meetings where we would go, what are we, what do we want? What do we need? What are we working on? What's your goal? How, how are you going to get to that goal? And then we'd kind of, anytime things kind of got off, we would have another summit meeting. And we always approached it from the point of view of like, it's almost like a business meeting, not an emotional meeting, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't ever feel like we were going into it going, I'm mad at you because of blah, blah, blah. We didn't ever fight like that in the meetings. We always came to it with like a business meeting. Yeah. But a business meeting as a family, because your family is sort of a business. And as parents, you manage the people in your family. You manage each other. You manage yourself, your pets, and your bills, and... You know, I think it was a. I thought it was a really productive way for us to go from that phase of life to this phase of life. But you're right; we haven't really had any reason to have a summit. The last summit meeting we had, yeah, was right after the Jair podcast. Oh, I guess it was. We I remember we sat down and we talked about you and how we were going to fix you. Yeah, that's right. And I think we kind of did it. I, I I don't know if we entirely did it. Because I think there is, I think there is a summit to be had because we had talked about a very long time ago when we first started dating, I said, 
we should write a movie together. And you said, I don't really work like that. Or you said something. I was like, well, no, let's, let's write a movie together. I was like, let's just spitball ideas. And we started spitballing ideas. And I, I think very erratically Mm -hmm. and I'm all over the map and I like to brainstorm and I like to move Mm -hmm. things forward. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I don't work like that. I don't work like that. We're not writing a script together. Right. And then when I wrote a book, I would go to the back, I would write it and then I would bring my chapter into Leanne. You'd read it. Yeah. And then you'd give me notes Uh and I'd go back and address your notes. I'd give it back to you. You'd give me more notes. You'd probably in one of those passages, you'd fixed all my grammatical and and errors. Yeah. And then once I got to a place, I'd send it to my publisher. Right. And, and I love working like that. And I believe that, that there is still, an, I think there is, a, especially the way that I see media moving, mm-hmm. you know, with me and Tony working on that project. Mm-hmm. I think there's a way for you to get back into writing if you choose to. But I think there's a, a, a streamlined way where we could do it together. Right. I, I, I think we should, I think we should have a summit again and figure out what we want to do i think that's a good idea but i, I do think that last summit brought on this podcast uh you're right it did i forgot i didn't even think about it we did i don't know that we called it a summit it, we but didn't. it was it was, it was. It was a impromptu summit where you were like i gotta make some changes and, and by the way I, I hope that if you're listening to this i hope that you realize that this was the conversation we had leanne was like i'm lost i don't have any direction i have no direction i have no i have nothing i'm passionate about and I said, well, you should start a podcast. And she said, who would listen? I said, it doesn't matter. And by the way, I'm saying this to you listening so that you know it doesn't fucking matter. You're right. And you were absolutely right. It doesn't Not fucking matter. Not that I matter. don't care. I do care who listens. But it, but it, that's not the purpose. The my, purpose the, is to purpose be creative. purpose is to be creative. Is to feel your creative outlet is being fulfilled. That's listen, right. I'll tell you right now. I, I don't like I, I there's no difference in my creative purpose being filled if I go to a club that has a hundred seats versus a theater that has fifteen hundred seats. Right. And, and I and I, and I say that so that you know that you know this podcast its reach may not be maybe as big as my podcast or definitely not as big as someone like Joe's podcast. Well, of course, but the not. creative outlet is, has is been identical. Amazing. The the feeling yeah. of feeling of I got to sit with my ideas Mm -hmm. and share my ideas and create new ideas and have a giggle. And if there's only 20,000 people that heard it, that's a lot. By the way, that's a lot. And if it's not, no, it's not 20 million, but it doesn't matter. It's like, let it, let it just, let it be what it is. Don't ever think about monetizing. Just let it be creative. Right. Let it be your creative outlet. And I think. I'll well, tell you right happens? now, this, this podcast has changed you immeasurably. It has. Made you so, this, you're, there's a part of you that's, I don't, I'm so happy is here, mm-hmm. but I haven't seen in such a long time. I feel the same way about myself. I'm happy it's here and I haven't seen it in a long you're the, time. You're, you, you are 15 pounds lighter. Okay. Maybe 12. 12 pounds lighter. <laughs> you look beautiful oh, i mean i've said thanks, how babe. many times have i said that to you in hawaii i was like you look gorgeous but it's not just what your your body looks like it's i, th- I think you feel fulfilled and i you feel like you're you're not just not doing anything i definitely feel like i am a priority to myself in a way i wasn't before so that is made all all the difference in the world i think is the feeling like i've put myself in the equation because before myself in the equation was always the last piece if i have time then i'll do that instead of going no actually i can do all of it but some things that i thought were important in the list of priorities will go below me like walking the dogs so Mm -hmm. okay why do i walk in the dogs come before me taking care of myself i can hire somebody to walk my dogs i sit on the couch and give my dogs plenty of love i play with them i feed them why do i have to be that too if that takes away from me having 30 more minutes to do research to do my podcast so it's, it's a shift in thinking in that book i read about the eight hours of sleep 
eight hours for sleep, eight hours for work, eight hours for whatever I want, really shifted my paradigm too about how I look at my day. Yeah. You know, I, I think I put everything into work mentally, not, and it's not true. There are some things that are actually what I choose to do. Like I choose to get up and make my daughter breakfast at 545 in the morning. I could choose to say, make your own breakfast at 545. There are plenty of parents who wouldn't do that, who would say, wake me up when you need a ride. But I choose to get up and make her breakfast and make her lunchbox every day. That's my choice. And that that shifted into that eight hours of whatever I want category. And it made me feel less exhausted and less kind of like put upon but I was putting it upon myself you know but for whatever reason shifting it into that whatever I want helps me feel better about it so then that trickles into so many other things that I feel better about uh, and yeah the podcast has been really great and you know it's the what happens in this room with my friends is pretty much club for the most part pretty close to what happens with my friends when we're at lunch or you know on a walk it, we're not different people and yeah. that was part of what i really wanted was for people to feel like they're hanging out with real people and a lot of people who listen have responded that they feel like they're in the room with us hanging out so i feel like i achieved that goal and then another goal was i wanted to learn something i wanted to learn something by doing the podcast and if i'm learning something on the podcast then some people listening would be learning something too by default perhaps because i know from like to bring it all the way back to the beginning of this podcast from the way i grew up i had a lot of learning to do from my the time I was like 20, I went, wow, I really am confused about the way life works because of what I grew up in. That's not the way I want life to work. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way I want my kids life to work. So now I have a lot of learning that I have to do that some people maybe didn't have to do. Yeah. So from the time I was really young, learning has been really important about not learning about Socrates or whatever, but learning about who we are and how we function and what your thoughts are so it can change your own thoughts about things and finding different perspectives. And I think that's what I wanted to do in the podcast. And so far, the the this is the 10th one. I think I think it's worked. So hopefully it'll keep going like that because I've really enjoyed it. And thank you for all your support. I couldn't have done it without you besides having the equipment. <laughs> but you've always, from the minute we got together, been incredibly supportive of me in any way that I wanted to do anything or be anything. You've never been a naysayer ever where I'm concerned. You've always been a yes man. Yes, how do we help you do that? Yes, how do we get that done? So that's really important, too, to have a teammate that's really your cheerleader. Well, I think I think what you forget is I see you as the person I met. I don't see you as the person that you think you are. Right. Like, And, and sadly, I hope that you see me as the person I am and not the person that you met. <laughs> uh, I see you as the person you are today well that's well then is that healthy that you see me because when we well, met no, i was i think you got writing lost. scripts I know. and i was i was definitely not i i definitely yeah i was definitely you were independent singularly focused and yeah. i can't be singularly focused now because i have two children but i remember the person i met who was uh who was driven and passionate and I was and very then you driven. Got sidetracked to, to, for my career. Well, I became driven and passionate about raising our kids. Yeah, and I became driven and passionate about uh, Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts, and I, and which is part of raising our kids. And I think I we, wouldn't do Girl Scouts if I didn't have girls in Girl Scouts. But I also became driven and passionate about your career. Yeah, I, I think in, uh, in again, inarguably, I am highly involved in the behind the scenes mechanisms of your career uh, you are more involved than me sometimes i am more involved than you sometimes thank you for saying that no I'm, I'm well aware of that i i i know for a fact that you will be the reason my special thanks goes out tomorrow because i'm just i like i don't certain things in my career don't interest me right and there are things that have to be done and yeah. i'm a taskmaster if anything else 
I, really, I would have never been on that phone call yesterday. I would have never gotten that. I would just, I just like all I care about is the creative. I, is the creative. I understand, and but so my my drive went toward you and our kids, and it's hard. It was hard to have drive also for me. Yeah. So I think this podcast really gave me drive for me, and it's something I can do. It's something I'm really excited about. I have so many episodes that I'm reading books about that I've already called and asked people, will you, I have like eight or nine already lined up to go, to keep going. So I can't wait to see what interests me after those next 10, you know, because I feel like I've learned so much from this first 10. I can't wait to see what I learned from the next 10 and what interests me coming out of those. I'm interested to see the progression of this podcast. I loved the sex podcast. It was really great. Oh, thanks. Um, it was like, really good. I like, I'm not going to tip the hat of where you're going, but I like the ideas of the interactive ones where you and Sandy go do something and talk about the said thing. Yes, we're definitely, I'm, I have two two things where I'm going to go experience something and then talk about it. But I keep getting people, people keep asking me, and Halston, maybe we should figure this out. How they can call and ask questions. It's very easy. Um, and I've said you can email, but no, those, I think if you people want, want if you, to call. If you, if you, we'll set it up so you can have a call in line, and they'll be directly into the board. Right. And it, I have it. I, ha- I did it for my phone. Um, I did it for my phone with Sean Evans. Okay. I bought the, t- the equipment so that he could call and I could plug it into my phone. So I don't know if I'd do that every segment, if I had just had a and a segment where people call with questions and I answer them yeah. or something. But that's something that um, I think would be cool. I used to like that. I used to want to do that for my podcast, but I, li- I've, I've, I, yeah. I like where my podcast is going. I'm really enjoying my solo podcast. And I think because I have my solo podcast, I don't feel the need to share some of that information that I'm accruing during the week with totally. my guest. Totally. I think it makes it me more involved with the guest. I really think the one I just did with Shane Torres is one of my best podcasts. I know people won't like it because we talk over each other at times, mm-hmm. but that's not what a conversation sounds like. So well, it was a natural conversation. A so. very natural four-hour conversation. A very natural four. Well, that means you really get along. And I love you have him. A lot I think he's great. connected and you have a lot to talk about. That's really cool. And so you liked my questions today? I think you did a fantastic job. I, oh, I did not know where we were going to go with this. Oh, no. And you had asked some really poignant questions. And some goofy ones. Yeah. And what sucks about this is this is kind of like foreplay. And now I'm turned on. I want to have sex. <laughs> Cause you, it's because you talked about the sex podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and Isla's sick and fucking in the house. But Oh, well. Oh, woe is Bert. Well, thank you for doing my episode 10. It was Congratulations, fun. 10 episodes. Thank you. Let's see who was my 10th episode. Who was your 10th? And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know, uh-huh. progressively, uh-huh. progressively, how... Oh, fuck, I'm never going to be able to find this. Bert Cast. Well, episode 11, I'm going to talk to... Sam and Lynn about our mothers. Our mothers are basically the same mother. Are you serious? Mac Faulkner. That was so long ago. February 2013. That was five years ago. I've been doing my podcast for five years. Congratulations. That's a big deal. That's that's right because it was at Christmas. Your first episode was with your dad, and Joey, and Tom, and Tom. That's that's fucking, right. That's crazy. That really is crazy. You have two hundred and how many? Two eighty one. Two eighty one. You would have had more than that if if you hadn't been on the Travel Channel during if some I that hadn't, time. If yeah. I hadn't, yeah, I, Travel Channel was. Uh, I had came to it not to prolong your podcast. I know you like to keep them at an hour. But, well, um, we're past an hour anyway. But um, I had a I had a realization last night mm-hmm. that I put in my Instagram stories. I'm obsessed with this show, Carnival Eats. I'm obsessed with it in like for nine different ways. Mm-hmm. I'm obsessed with it because the host is the host doesn't clumsy up the show, mm-hmm. but he doesn't put. There's no version of himself. It's a version of what he believes a good host should be. Mm-hmm. So it's very like uh, campy, cheesy lines. 
Mm-hmm. Like it's almost like Ace Venturi. Mm-hmm. Like there's no real authentic host, and like he's not an authentic guy. I'm sure he is an authentic guy, but I went through his Instagram and the pictures he puts of himself versus who he represents himself to be on the on the show is not the same. It's not in tune. But I can't shit on his lack of comedy because what it does is it moves this, the show forward very quickly it just doesn't clumsy it up it streamlines it uh-huh. and i realize i'm not here for the guy i'm here for the food uh, i just want to yeah, watch yeah. the food yeah. i don't give a fuck about the guy right and the less he clumsies it up the more i get to see the food and i had an epiphany last night and i sent a, a, a message on instagram to stacy uh lonnie patrick yeager uh sean hauser callie all my producers who I dug my heels in with all the time for me to be original and and not hacky and be authentic. I mean, they have a shot in this Carnival Eats where he is, uh, he's, they have it lit. I would never let them light sets. I would never let them light it. But it's lit. I know it's lit. I know it's lit because I'm seeing it. And I know it's lit because I'm watching the behavior. So when you light a set... In, in like say at a carnival and you set up lights, what you get is all the people that want to be on TV and all the people that want to be on TV often are the people that are the last people that should be on TV. Right. Mo- or more often than not. And what happens is they flub lines and they do it again the second time. And sometimes as a host, when they're doing it their third time, you know what they're going to say and you can't help but you mouth along the words with them. <laughs> And <laughs> you do that. You do that. You ghost eat with people. Yes. Or you and pretend like you're like, oh, yeah. Well, someone's taking a bite. And so you can't help it. It's just you've heard a guy say it three times. You know what he wants to say. You want to say it for him. And then you're like, oh, this, yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, there's a scene where the host is saying the words along with it. And that's the reason I would never. But only me is going to see that. Only me right. would notice, oh, this has been lit. I bet he's going to. Because I'm a host. I know that. And I realized last night I fought so hard to be authentic. So hard to be original. So hard to be a great fucking host who delivered an amazing show that was unlike any show you ever saw. Mm-hmm. And last night I realized, oh, <laughs> that's never going to fucking happen. And number two, no one ever tunes in for the host. They tune in for the show. Right. The, sh- the host. For what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, they replaced uh, Adam Richmond on Man vs. Food. Yeah. I still watch Man vs. Food. Right. Don't anyone tell Adam Richmond. <laughs> I still watch Man vs. Food. And I just... And that host clumsies it up like crazy. Oh, yeah. But I he also still watch the else. show. And I was like... And that's why I'm so happy. Right now, that's why I'm so happy. Is I don't have to fight to dig my heels in to be anyone. I get to go on stage and be myself. Mm-hmm. I get to do my combat podcast be myself. I do my solo podcast be myself. I write the show with Tony. We create the show. We make the show. I be myself. The project we're going to do in the man cave with Mans. Yep. That's my project. I be myself. Yeah. You showing up to be me, be myself. It's autonomy. I love autonomy. We'll be discussing that. Uh, it's just, it's just part of the book drive. And like two episodes from now, I think it's going to be that book club. We'll see. Anyway, thanks for doing my podcast. Thank you for having number me on Number one, number 10. Congratulations. Thanks, babe. I love you. Love you too.